Today, we are tackling a big controversial subject, which is should you do genetic testing on your embryos or not? But before we get into this, I understand there are many different terms for pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT. To keep things simple, I'm just going to say genetic testing, right? So I had a client who kept on doing egg retrievals. She would have about two blasts. She would test and they were always abnormal. She, and she was going to a great clinic and I love the clinic, love, love. Try again, abnormal. She had never been to an actual embryo transfer. And finally, I just said to her, why don't you stop testing your embryos? Now, she looked at me as if I was asking her to basically grow her embryos in a mason jar next to her window seal. So I explained, you want to test because you don't want a genetically abnormal child, right? She's like, okay, Tasha's sane. Yes, but you did try naturally and you even did IUI, right? Yes. And that was the same sperm and egg that you used for IVF, correct? And she finally paused a bit and understood that trying naturally and doing IUI were just as much of a big risk, quote unquote, if you're not watching the video, <laughs> than her doing IVF and not testing her embryos. For someone like her that is just exhausted and she's thinking about egg donor, she's thinking about stopping, she's wondering, you know, will I ever be a mom and should I just ever do IVF? I believe that not testing was the right next step for her. And to be honest, I now believe that most people should not do genetic testing. Now, I will explain why and I'll also give you a whole list of reasons or a whole list of times when I do highly recommend genetic testing. But from what I am hearing, and this has changed over the years, even it's changed a lot since I was doing IVF, okay? Mila is 10 and a half, so figure over nine years ago is when I, the last time I was doing IVF. This has changed a lot too. I feel like in America, I work in like almost every country, but in America, genetic testing is really, really pushed. And I feel like the doctors are insinuating if you don't do testing, you will have a genetically abnormal child. And that just isn't reasonable to me. Why would doing IVF increase the odds for a genetically abnormal child when in reality, IVF is just giving you your existing eggs. It does not create more eggs. Okay. It helps you create more alphas that have the ability to fertilize and grow into embryos instead of in nature, only one or two alphas kind of rise up and the rest get reabsorbed into the body. But it doesn't alter, doing IVF isn't altering your quality of your eggs or your sperm or your odds of having a healthy child. Here has been my experience since 2016. I have worked with hundreds of IVF clients personally, one-on-one. -on -one. And in all of that time, I've had one client get pregnant and have a genetically abnormal child stick, one. And she got pregnant naturally. For 99 point plus percent of the time, not an actual statistic, but it's over 99%, an embryo doesn't implant at all. Or it is a loss before or right around eight weeks. I don't even see many losses after 12 weeks. And when I looked up the statistic for how many genetically abnormal children are there, this is what I found. Edward syndrome, 0.03%. Trisomy 13, that was trisomy 18. Trisomy 13, 0.01%. Turner syndrome, 0.04%. And the most common Down syndrome has a 0.1% birth rate. On the flip side, I cannot tell you how many clients that have never gotten a genetically normal embryo have stopped testing and have gone on to make beautiful, genetically normal children. Could that be the biggest coincidence in all of mankind? Yes. I just don't believe that. Which of course, made me start to wonder, especially, by the way, as I saw normal embryos go in, abnormal come out, or my clients stop testing, and their seemingly always abnormal embryos create normal children, it makes me wonder how perfect the testing is. 
And of course, now there is so much research coming out about how it's not a perfect science. Now, we oh, no doctor will tell you it's a perfect science. We all know it's never been a perfect science. But the new stuff is kind of like, yeah, wow, this is just impossible for it to be usually that accurate. And it's just because of how it's done. You're not testing the fetus, right? There are only a few cells that the fetus are that are going to make the, the whole the whole human. You are testing the outside cells, okay? And so there's this great research study basically showing, you know, all the cells that are available for testing typically at that stage and how any any segment of cells that they could have picked. And I think they show like three or four different segments. One is normal. The other one is like half normal, you know, half abnormal. And then the other segment, if they pick that would have been totally abnormal. This isn't all to say I'm against genetic testing. I just think that the conversation about genetic testing has in America, really, I'm again, other countries have a totally different stance about this. But in the States, I think that and at most clinics, not all, I think that it's like genetic testing is being screamed at us as the thing you need to do unless you're the craziest mofo doing IVF that we all know. Okay, so here are some things that I've seen over the years that have changed my stance on genetic testing, and then I will go into who should consider genetic testing. All right, to start the list, and I mentioned this, normal, I put that in quotes, air quotes if you're not watching the video, <laughs> Embryos go in. We know there's going to be a pregnancy loss. We ask for um, at the DNC a testing of the fetal tissue and abnormal tissue, fetus coming back, typically trisomy or something. That in general, and this was, I remember this a couple times at, at, a, at a clinic that I know their lab is exceptional. It's just not a perfect science. Um, number two, again, I mentioned this. We finally stopped testing and my client has never, ever made a normal embryo. And the one time they don't test and they do a transfer, it is normal. And of course, I don't think this is a coincidence. And this has happened to my clients many, many times. So I, I, in, you know, when, when weighing pros and cons, when my whole goal for my clients is to as little IVF as possible and get out of IVF world and like have your babies. And so if I'm weighing how long they stay doing IVF, and is testing going to cut the rate of them doing IVF, cut the time of them needing to do IVF at all versus put in the untested embryos and which one makes it go by faster before a healthy child? It's always, for my practice, stop the testing, put in the embryos, and that's where my clients see the fastest success. I mentioned this already, testing isn't perfect. It depends on where the cells are getting, which cells are getting sampled. Because of the new research coming out, I am hearing a little bit of rumbling of, hey, now we are going to transfer mosaics or, or abnormal embryos. And it's like, you know, they're not going to change their tune unless there is a lot of research and support saying, this might not be right, right? Um, number four, especially in Europe, when I'm I'm working in Europe, they don't test over 40. They're like, what's what's the point? It's always going to be abnormal. What's the point of that? And they don't trust the testing. It's not that they want their <laughs> citizens to have a abnormal embryo. It's they understand. They're really looking at the testing and how it can't be perfect and saying, why are we wasting our time? Number five, lab issues. Okay. I have personally seen a few things happen. One, a client having no normal embryos. Switch clinics that's, that use different uh, labs and all of a sudden, the majority, but the vast majority, like 90% of their embryos are normal. That, that doesn't make sense because they're, they're older by the time they go to another clinic, right? I have also heard of the really scary, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened, like stories where it's wrong. And the genetic testing is wrong. And, and you discover that because, you know, you know about how many embryos should come back normal or abnormal based on somebody's age. And when it's, that's not right that these are all abnormal and there were so many of them, that's where you start digging into things. That's where you start to see, oh my gosh, there is a mistake. There was human error. Now you are not going to hear about this for the most part. I mean, kudos to any 
clinic that is actually admitting this stuff. But what you will just hear is, oh my gosh, you have terrible egg quality and we just need to do this again, or you need to try egg dart. So while that is rare and gosh, I hope that's more rare than, you know, I hope that's rare, but I've definitely heard of that. I've definitely seen that. Um, and so I can't discount that, you know, lab issues make me a little bit nervous about doing testing. Um, and also just think about it, you know, the embryo has to go through multiple stressors to get to testing. It has to grow from J3 to blastocyst. It has to go through hatching. It has to go through the biopsy and the testing. All of that are additional stressors. So if you only have one or two fertilized eggs or even just one to two day three embryos or even one to two blastocysts, it's like leave them alone. I think they will do better just being left alone and then being put back with mama. Um, another reason why, and again, here's cynical Tasha's hat coming on, Deep, there it goes, that I have a hard time supporting genetic testing is because it does make the clinics a lot more money, okay? This is a cash cow for clinics. Why? Because you have to do so many more retrievals to find that unicorn embryo, right? I know, first of all, like even how they assess the genetics can be it's subjective based on certain clinics. So I do know of certain clinics that are extra, extra hard on testing where any other clinic would be like, that's, that's fine. That's normal. And they'd be like, nope, it's not perfect. Well, guess what? That makes you have to do how many egg retrievals, how many expensive and costly. Those two are different. One is financial. The other one is your mental health, energy, time, and it's sucking the life out of you very costly procedures. So it is benefiting the clinic more and it is not benefiting the client. This is what I call profit first practices versus patient first, first practices. Do I believe that the clinics are like, how do we screw them? No, hmm. but I do know that when there is a board meeting, the first question is not, hey, did we reduce the amount of IVF that we have to do because we are so successful? That's never going to be the first question in a board meeting, right? It is going to be about profits and revenue. So while I know that that sounds cynical, and I'll take my cynical hat off in just a minute, it is the facts. When you have to genetically test, and I, by the way, you never have to genetically test. I have my clients be like, no, my clinic says I have to. Absolutely, you don't. But when you're with a clinic that's like, you're the dumbest person alive if you don't genetically test your embryos, okay? Also know they're is an incentive for them. There is a prize for them when you do do genetic testing. And then the last thing that has made me meh, so sad, <laughs> so sad sometimes when it comes to consulting clients uh, and, and deciding, you know, about genetic testing or not is when it's too late. I can't tell you the amount of clients or even just followers that DM me and they'll say, like, do you know any clinic that will transfer abnormal? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, there are a couple now, but like for the most part, no. But it breaks my heart because I know they regret testing. And I don't know if they should regret it or not. It is what it is. But the fact that they're now like, I want to keep these abnormal embryos and I need to figure out a way to transfer them. If they never tested them, they would be, be they would be able to transfer them literally, well, not anywhere, be, at their clinic though. The more that I see my clients like backtrack, like I wish I, I didn't test, you know, the, the more that I'm like, let's just, let's just skip this. Let's just skip this testing part of it. Okay. And here is when I do recommend genetic testing. One, you're using an exceptional lab and they use, uh, whether it's their own or whatever lab they're using for genetic testing is exceptional. So they have the best embryologist doing these biopsies and they have the best lab doing the genetic testing. Um, two, if you have had multiple miscarriages. Now, that's kind of like I would probably take that case by case because the first thing I'd look at is karyotype, right? Testing you and your partner. If there was a partner involved, I would first do that blood test. Like, is there a karyotype issue that, you know, will tell us we're going to have more abnormal embryos? But overall, we're having a lot of miscarriages and maybe we need to find some answers. You know, that could be a reason. It could be. Uh, number three, there is a known genetic disorder that you need to avoid. That's where you get a specialized probe made and you do, you don't always need a specialized probe, but anyway, that's when you do genetic testing. Um, if you have a lot of blastocysts, I always say four or more, go to the next phase. So four or more blastocysts, 
And even then you don't have to, but this is a time where if you want to do genetic testing and you have four or more blastocysts, that I feel like is a good amount to feel, I would feel comfortable with having my clients move forward with next. Number six, if you, if you're just like, I have to do genetic testing, right? Um, and you switch clinics, I would be very curious what those tests say. However, I would probably tell my client to do number seven, which is if they've always had abnormal embryos, but it's like, no, 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 now we're going to another clinic that has another lab. I would say do number seven, which is the hybrid approach, if your clinic allows it. And of course, depending on how many embryos you have. But this is where you put the, the two best looking embryos aside and you test the rest. Okay, why I say the two best looking ones is because not that it's always the case, but if they're the best looking ones, they're, they're, they're most likely to be genetically normal. That is definitely not the case, but maybe. So it's like, okay, worst case scenario, that's what I always have to plan for. They all come back abnormal. You're like, well, I still have the best looking ones on ice untested, so I can trust those. Or you test the, you know, the, the, the rest of them and the two best looking ones are frozen and there is a normal. You can be like, Yay, probably those two are normal also, because if if this one is normal, then those other two might be normal, right? So either way, I feel like it puts you in more of a win-win situation. We definitely have embryos on ice. We have two great looking embryos on ice, and then we get a little bit of information about the rest of them. Overall, genetic testing is a great tool to use when it's used strategically and properly and done properly by the most exceptional clinics. If you are running out of time, steam, you only have a couple embryos that ever make it, this is where I probably wouldn't move forward with genetic testing. And, you know, going back to if you could get pregnant naturally, would you? I would have said hell yes to that. I don't, I don't know about you, but I would have been like, oh, please, any day now, please. So this is where we have to know what we are most afraid of is very rare that it will happen. But to know what is best for you, Take in all the information. Talk to your doctor and get the information. You listen to this podcast. Sit, get quiet, and make the decision that feels right for you. Well, that was our uncovering for the day. If you have a feeling that your IVF protocols or strategies could use a second opinion, start with our website, TashaBlasi.com, for resources and even a free discovery call where we can learn about your specific IVF needs and see how we can help.